Do you know how the orcs first came into being? Most will say they were elves once, tortured and mutilated by the first Dark Lord. But throughout the decades, this is a topic Tolkien himself would revisit and throw into doubt. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the many origins of Tolkien's orcs. It's pretty widely known how the orcs first came into being, at least the version from the Silmarillion. Because Morgoth could not create true life himself, he captured and corrupted some of the early elves, twisting them into creatures we would come to know as orcs. However, Tolkien's first explanation is found in the Book of Lost Tales, where Morgoth, here called Melko, bred orcs of the subterranean heats and slime. Their hearts were of granite and their bodies deformed. The orcs, in a similar manner to the dwarves created by Aule, are made from stone. It would seem Tolkien would stick with this origin for quite a long time. As he would write in the Quenta Noldorinwa in the 1930s, the hordes of the orcs he made of stone, but their hearts of hatred. Gamoth, people of hate, the gnomes called them. Goblins they may be called, but in ancient days they were strong and cruel and fell. Later, in the 1937 version of Quinta Silmarillion, Tolkien would add, but in that time Morgoth made many monsters of diverse kinds and shapes that long troubled the world. Yet the orcs were not made until he had looked upon the elves, and he made them in mockery of the children of Iluvatar. This brings in the orcish connection to elves, though in this version, Morgoth creates the orcs after seeing the elves, making them as his own perverted version of the first children of Iluvatar. However, this version of the tale would prove incompatible with the nature of creation as Tolkien would portray in his created world. For it is abundantly clear that only Iluvatar himself, the god of Tolkien's world, could truly create life. We see this in Aule's creation of the dwarves. The smith of the Valar is able to make these beings out of stone. However, they are only capable of movement and action when Aule himself directly wills them to do so. In a way, like a child playing with their action figures. The dwarves are, initially, just empty vessels, incapable of independence. As you can imagine, this presented a problem for Tolkien's orcs. Iluvatar would not have given Fear, or souls, to the orcs of Morgoth, as he does with the dwarves. Thus, they would need to come from beings already created. And here is where we get the most widely accepted version of orcish origins. In Tolkien's writings from the 1950s, he says that around the year of the trees 1085, Morgoth captures elves who fled in fear of Orome. For the Dark Lord himself had sown distrust of the Valar among the elves. But of those hapless who were ensnared by Melkor, little is known of a certainty. For who of the living hath descended into the pits of Utumno, or hath explored the darkness of the councils of Melkor? Yet this is held true by the wise of Eresea, that all those of the Quendi that came into the hands of Melkor, ere Utumno was broken, were put there in prison, and by slow arts of cruelty and wickedness were corrupted and enslaved. Thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the Orkor, in envy and mockery of the Eldar, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the Orkor had life, and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar, and not that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make since his rebellion in the Ainulindale before the beginning? So say the wise. And deep in their dark hearts the Orkor loathed the master whom they served in fear, the maker only of their misery. This maybe was the vilest deed of Melkor, and the most hateful to Eru. In one of his letters from 1954, Tolkien further explains, I have represented at least the orcs as pre-existing real beings, on whom the Dark Lord has exerted the fullness of his power in remodeling and corrupting them, not making them. He also demonstrates that of all the horrible things Morgoth did, 
This would be the very worst. They would be Morgoth's greatest sins, abuses of his highest privilege, and would be creatures begotten of sin and naturally bad. Despite their evil nature derived from Morgoth, Tolkien notes, though being the fingers of the hand of Morgoth, they must be fought with the utmost severity, they must not be dealt with in their own terms of cruelty and treachery. Captives must not be tormented, not even to discover information for the defense of the homes of elves and men. If any orc surrendered and asked for mercy, they must be granted it, even at a cost. This was the teaching of the wise, though in the horror of the war, it was not always heeded. Tolkien explains further in a footnote that orcs would not treat with elves, because Morgoth was so successful in convincing the orcs, beyond refutation, that elves were even crueler than themselves, saying that elves would only take captives for amusement or to eat them, something the orcs themselves were guilty of. And it is the previous writings, specifically those of the elves taken captive by Melkor, that Christopher Tolkien would use in crafting the published Silmarillion, leading this to become the most widely known and accepted origin for the orcs. But interestingly enough, this would not be Tolkien's final word on orcs. In the late 50s and early 60s, Tolkien hypothesized some alternate origins which steer orcs away from elves. We find in these writings things like orcs having mannish ancestry. Finally, there is a cogent point, though horrible to relate. It became clear in time that undoubted men could, under the domination of Morgoth or his agents, in a few generations be reduced almost to the orc level of mind and habits. And then they would or could be made to mate with orcs, producing new breeds, often larger and more cunning. There is no doubt that long afterwards, in the Third Age, Saruman rediscovered this, or learned of it in lore, and in his lust for mastery committed this, his wickedest deed, the interbreeding of orcs and men, producing both men orcs large and cunning, and orc men treacherous and vile. Here it is Sauron, not Morgoth, breeding orcs in mockery of men. For Morgoth was already held captive by the Valar when the men awoke in Middle-earth. Though it's important to note that the idea of doing this evil deed is credited to Morgoth, though his servant executes it. Yet there is still more that Tolkien had to say as he tinkered, some say struggled, with the origin of orcs, much of which can be chalked up to Tolkien's own faith. Having beings with actual souls held as irredeemable is a concept that fits neither with Tolkien's worldview nor the world he set up, with the omniscient and omnibenevolent Iluvatar as its god. So how can one reconcile this seeming discrepancy? A race of being brought about by and falling under the complete sway of the dark powers, yet the need for beings with souls to be capable of redemption. One possible option is that they are indeed soulless beings. In summary, I think it must be assumed that talking is not necessarily the sign of possession of a rational soul, or fea. The orcs were beasts of humanized shape, to mock men and elves, deliberately perverted slash converted into a more close resemblance to men. Their talking was really reeling off records set in them by Melkor. Even their rebellious critical words, he knew about them. Melkor taught them speech, and as they bred they inherited this, and they had just as much independence as have, say, dogs or horses of their human masters. This talking was largely echoic, and he gives the example of parrots. Tolkien goes on to explain that should orcs be derived from elves, their fea, or soul, would go to the halls of Mandos and be held until the end of the world. But let's return to the previous idea that the orcs themselves don't have Fea, that they are indeed soulless, merely acting out and speaking that which Morgoth imbued into them. This concept of seemingly intelligent creatures capable of independent thought, speech, and action is not foreign to Middle-earth. Indeed, Tolkien himself confirmed that the great eagles did not have Fea. They are intelligent beasts and play a great role but they are beasts nonetheless. 
The same goes for Huon, the great hound of Valinor. In the same essay, entitled Myths Transformed, Tolkien describes the orcs under Morgoth's influence, in which I think through the lens of orcs being beasts, in a similar manner of eagles, is quite interesting. It is true, of course, that Morgoth held the orcs in dire thraldom, for in their corruption they had lost almost all possibility of resisting the domination of his will. So great indeed did its pressure upon them become ere Angband fell, that if he turned his thought towards them, they were conscious of his eye, wherever they might be. And when Morgoth was at last removed from Arda, the orcs that survived in the west were scattered, leaderless, and almost witless, and were for a long time without control or purpose. The description of orcs as scattered and witless, without control or purpose, certainly can be seen as cohesive with the notion of orcs being more beast than man. Yet one of my favorite personal theories involves an even more tragic and unnatural occurrence, truly worthy of being Morgoth's most wicked deed. What if the orcs were indeed corrupted from elves or men, beings with souls, but those souls were driven out by Morgoth's evil? Again, this is not an idea without evidence in Middle-earth. For this, we turn to more recently published pages, those coming in The Nature of Middle-earth, edited by Carl Hostetter. In an article entitled Death of Incarnate Bodies, we find, usually the Fea departs only because the body is injured beyond recovery, so that its coherence is already broken. But what if the Fea deserts a body which is not greatly injured, or which is whole? It then, it might be thought, remains a living corporeal body, but without mind or reason. It becomes an animal, or kelva, seeking nothing more than food by which its corporeal life may be continued, and seeking it only after the manner of beasts, as it may find it by limbs and senses. This is a horrible thought. Maybe such things have indeed come to pass in Arda, where it seems that no evil or perversion of things and their nature is impossible but it can have happened only seldom. Tolkien goes on to tell us that this was indeed an act that both Dark Lords took part in, this separation of body and soul with the body living on. For it is recorded in the histories that Morgoth and Sauron after him would drive out the Fea by terror and then feed the body and make it a beast. Or worse, he would daunt the Fea within the body and reduce it to impotence and then nourish the body foully, so that it became bestial, to the horror and torment of the Fea. For me, the last line is the most bone-chilling. The idea that a being's very soul would be reduced within the body to impotence. In the potential example of the orcs, we would have souls trapped within these twisted evil bodies, only capable of feeling horror and torment, until perhaps a release of death and as we read earlier, flight to the halls of Mandos. Whatever their origin, there's no doubt Tolkien's famous words hold true. They would be Morgoth's greatest sins. And for the orcs, Morgoth would be maker only of their misery. As always, I wanna say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Swirl Traveler, Matthew Jeffrey, Viking Lord, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Micah Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.